Well, good afternoon, and thanks for joining our webinar today. I'm Elliot Dennis, Assistant Professor and Extension Livestock Economist in the Department of Agricultural Economics at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And today is part of the Center of Agriculture Profitability's weekly webinar series, which happens every Thursday at noon central. A full schedule of previous and future recordings is available at the website, cap.unl.edu. Again, that's cap.unl.edu. Today's webinar is the second webinar in this week looking at meat processing um, plant issues with a focus on Nebraska. We recorded the previous one on Tuesday of this week dealing with the legal and financial issues surrounding the development of new meat processing plants. And that's already available on our website at cap.unl.edu. So over the next hour or so, we'll cover how the market and political climate has led to the allocation of grant dollars for meat processing plants and what are the available grant opportunities for producers and what the University of Nebraska-Lincoln is doing to increase meat processing training and skills and abilities within students and the industry at large. Today, I'm joined by Gary Sullivan, Associate Professor of Meat Science at University of Nebraska-Lincoln um, and Greg Ibach. IBOC INR is Undersecretary in Residence here at UNL, as well as Dave Aiken, a Professor and Agricultural Law Specialist here with us as well. First off, welcome everyone. And I'll begin the webinar by briefly talking about meat processing consolidation, followed by Gary Sullivan to discuss some of the current uh, situation that led to grant opportunities, as well as the grant opportunities themselves for meat processors. And then we'll conclude with some comments by uh, Greg Ibach. We anticipate that this portion of the webinar will take about 40 minutes, leaving about 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers. We'd encourage you as we go through the webinar, if you have questions that you would like addressed, uh, to please put those in the uh, question and answer section, um, and we can get those, any points of clarification, comments, or suggestions at the end of the webinar. I'll go ahead and start with this. And um, all right, so uh, first wanted to kind of set the stage on how we kind of got to this point where we were allocating you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to the development of really small and medium-sized processing plants. And the first is that uh, COVID-19 was occurring really in February, March, and April. And what we saw is that the number of cases per capita with, was growing larger in counties where there were meat processing plants. So that's what this figure on the left is. This is a COVID cases per capita. Um, and these different types of lines represent whether there were, there was a meat processing, a chicken processing plant or a pork processing plant within the county itself. And what you really saw is that there was uh, um, a larger share of, of cases per capita increasing in counties where there were, were large meat processing or processing plants. And what we saw is that actually that there was kind of this disproportion also between what we consider the big four, or the top four meat processing plants and the other meat processing plants. That's what these figures over here on the right uh, indicate. This is uh, cases per capita and it's, it's broken out by the top four corporations and these other uh, meat processing plants. This right here on the left is for beef and over here is in the pork. I have similar ones for for poultry processing plants and for other ones, but for uh, to be consistent, I'll just, or concise, I'll focus on these two plants. And what we saw is that really since the first day that we, there was a incident at the plant, we saw a large spike in the number of, of cases per capita in beef and poultry plants. But during this time, uh, these meat processing plants, went ahead and implemented CDC and OSHA regulations, which included things like increased spacing between workers, plexiglass, um, and additional safety measures 
to try to limit the spread of COVID-19. Well, that eventually led to the decrease in the spread of COVID-19 amongst plant workers. This is not important because even right now we're having discussions about whether uh, the meat processing plants did everything they could, but because they had a limited uh, amount of labor, because they were uh, allowing people to take paid time off to reduce the spread, as well as uh, increase the spacing between employees, which led to lower chain speeds um, in the processing plant. What this ended up doing is it reduced the amount of animals that were able to be processed. Now, the way the industry is currently structured is that there's large processing plants uh, that uh, process a large amount of, or a large share of the total animals in production. And we'll look at how that's changed over time. But this is really that COVID-19 incident. We started having those issues, which re reduced the number of, of animals, in this case, cattle that we were able to slaughter. But as workers started coming back um, to work, we were able to control the spread. We we're actually able to stabilize um, the number of animals harvested. But it's we're still susceptible to labor shortages. And that's what this is showing right here. When labor doesn't show up, we're actually unable to harvest those animals. So just curious, uh, this has led to a lot of discussion about uh, meat packing consolidation and in particular the concern about the four largest uh, meat processing plants um, within each segment. And so the question that we're just curious to see where uh, the audience is, is in what year did the top four firms begin to harvest approximately 80% of all steers and heifers? Wait about 10 more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll here. And we can see that, uh, let's see, 24 or about 9% of people said 1975, 30% 1981, 24% 1993, uh, 30% 2004 and 6% 2012. Well, the year was about 1993. So this is taking a compilation of the reports from the Packers and Stockyards, which is an annual report. And they define consolidation um, using what they call the uh, four firm concentration ratio. And they break this concentration ratio by types of, of products. This is, you can find a similar one for uh, pork and for poultry. Um, and really what this concentration ratio is trying to demonstrate is what is the share of the four largest firms in the industry? And as we increase this concentration ratio, what we see is that, um, that it, it implies that there's a higher degree of concentration. This blue line is the steer and heifer uh, slaughter. So about in 1993, uh, we had about 80% of all of the animals were harvested uh, by the four largest firms. So pretty, I mean, pretty significant consolidation happening between 1980 and 1993. We'll talk a little bit about what were potentially some of the drivers. And then we'll notice this little bump in um, about 2008, 2009, and that was when we had a merger occur. So one of the reasons why we have these large plants or why there's such a desire to have plants become larger is really down to two functions. Uh, the first being economies of scale. So I just pulled two photos of uh, meat processing plants. Over here, we have kind of a smaller meat processing plant. And then over here, we have obviously a, a large meat processing plant. Well, what we know is that as plants are able to process more animals uh, per day, what they're able to effectively do is lower their average to total cost. And that's what this, this graph is showing over here on the right. Uh, going up and down is their average total cost. This is dollars per head. Um, and then 
the line going down is what, what we call that average total cost curve. Going on this, well, x-axis, this is how many head are harvested per month. And what we see is that this, these arrows indicate plant size. So if a plant harvests 1.7 million head per year, they're actually 5% more efficient than a plant that harvests 1.3 million head per year and 12% more efficient than a plant that harvests 950,000 head per year. And so there's, because we're always competing to be the low, low cost producer so that we can increase margins and, and grow, there is a, a large desire to, to increase plant size. And one of the reasons why we're able to increase plant size is because we're actually able to have workers specialize in certain parts of the fabrication process. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we can see plants have a desire to grow larger and to eventually consolidate. But I think one thing we should point out is that there has been, uh, technology has been one of the primary drivers of consolidation. Uh, I just put a couple of these pictures on what were some of the key factors that were driving consolidation really up pre-1970. Uh, we had the steamboat, which allowed salt to be shipped up um, the Mississippi River to so that we could uh, basically cure uh, meat production and not allow us just to have meat processing happen in the winter months. Then with the, the railroad, we were actually able to ship livestock, live um, cattle, hogs to the meat processing plants in the East Coast. But then that's pretty expensive because we're shipping about 40% of, pro of, of that weight is not going to be used for meat production after harvest. And so what they developed was the refrigerated um, rail car, which allowed animals to be shipped to central locations or stockyards, such as Chicago, have large harvesting plants there, and then they would then ship the carcasses all the way to the East Coast or where the population was, where further processors would then break down the carcasses. And that pretty much occurred all the way to the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, when the refrigerated truck came to be, and were actually able to um, to ship um, carcasses by um, the actual carcass to the different locations. And then really in the 1970s, when Iowa beef processors came, what they said, rather than shipping carcasses, why don't we ship boxes of beef? Why don't we break down the carcass right here? And so that's when we started shipping out box, boxed beef. And so all of those things led to consolidation happening at different times in the industry. A lot of it had to do with geography prior to 1970 because we didn't have uh, the railroads and the interstate highway prior to 1950. And then in the 1970s, we really started to see consolidation happen from the outside of, the, of let's say like Pennsylvania and California and all that consolidation really started to happen within the Midwest. So we know that, that this was happening is because uh, USDA uh, NAS actually collects this data and reports it yearly um, by plant by plant size. And so what I did is I went and compiled this data and plotted this. And so uh, what we're seeing here is four different graphs that kind of show us where plants, the number of plants and the size of plants um, over time. So right here, this panel A shows us the number of plants that are existing federally inspected plants that existed in the US uh, by plant size. And this is plant capacity per year. So if we wanna convert this to um, a daily harvest capacity, you can divide that by about 255 working days would, would give you a, about an average of, of daily head capacity. And what we see is that uh, the number of, head, number of plants across all sizes were consolidating between 1980 and, and really about 2010. This red line is the, um, and the, this gold line are the two plants uh, of interest right now, given the grant applications, because these are the ones that we consider small, very small meat processing plants. Um, these would harvest anywhere from three head a day to five head a day. 
what we see is that even though they were decreasing, the total share of total plants in the US was actually pretty constant. So everyone was experiencing across all different types of uh, plant size was experiencing consolidation, um, even amongst um, the larger plants. And panel, this panel B and D actually shows us that even though the number of plants was consolidating, larger, these larger plants started to harvest a lot more animals. So this is total head harvested in, in, in thousands of head. And in 1980, uh, plants that had a yearly capacity of 500,000 head or more, they were harvesting somewhere in the range of about you know, 80,000 um, 80, head and going all the way up to you know, a large portion. Uh, panel D shows this total head harvest as, as, as a share of total head harvested. And they harvested in about, in 2019, firms that had over 500,000 head capacity harvested about 70% 70, 70 of all the cattle and, or, or all the, yeah, all the cattle in the US. So plants were consolidating across all different sizes, but big, these big plants were getting much, much bigger, which kind of led to the idea that, you know, they were actually trying to economize on these economies of scale by growing existing plants much larger. But this intensity of harvest wasn't the same across all locations. And so USDA actually reports this information by state as well. They report the number of federally inspected plants by state. They do not report uh, federally inspected plants by state by size. And so this is for what this shows is the share of number never plants and total head harvested across all plant uh, sizes. And what we see really the main story is that all of this consolidation happened, started moving from the coast, whether the west coast or the east coast and really centralizing in the Midwest. So about, and the, one of the largest beneficiar, beneficiaries of this consolidation has, has been Nebraska. But because of this consolidation, um, this has often led to people, to, uh, producers or even the public to have concerns about this. And some of them are, are very well warranted. Um, currently there is an investigation going on that really began in 2019 with the, uh, when the Holcomb, Kansas packing plant or the packing plant in Holcomb, Kansas burned down. And then in 2020, that was widened to include the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, a report by AMS was released on, had some of the findings, but ultimately they were just reporting on what they found. They didn't have any real jurisdiction to uh, indicate whether someone was liable or not. That falls on the Department of Justice. They still have an ongoing investigation, but this has widened to include numerous congressional hearings strictly upon the markets and competition and has led to several bills and laws, including uh, allocation of grant dollars for new and existing meat processing plants. But what I was curious was, you know, we had this investigation and how often um, have we had investigations or calls? Uh, we've had numerous, numerous uh, accusations of price fixing, but how many times has Congress actually um, investigated the meat processing industry since 1850. So just curious what you guys think. How many times has, the, has Congress investigated the meat processing interest, industry since 1850? Okay, well, about five more seconds. Okay, let me end this. Okay, this is uh, about pretty even across there. 20% um, of people said about five times, largest about 15 or 26% said about 15 times. Well, what I've been able to find using the Packers and Stock Starts report, including a 
paper published by a faculty member here in the department, uh, Professor Azam, back in 1998, showed that there's been about eight calls for investigation from Congress um, on the meat processing industry since about 1850. Um, some of these have led to changes. We can think about the, the antitrust, um, trust bust that happened in the 1920s. But I think what I wanted to point out was that, um, is that there's a long history of, of government intervention and also government uh, investigation in the meat processing industry. And what's normally happened is uh, these investigations have occurred as we've seen large increases in uh, their either the retail or the boxed price and a subsequent decline in the uh, farm gate or um, prices producers receive for, for livestock. And so the fact that we're experiencing or asking Congress to investigate this is, is not surprising. And so as I mentioned, some, some of these things that the the government is doing to, to try to address these current public concerns is additional market transparency. Uh, we were able to authorize the livestock marketing uh, mandatory price reporting, which is uh, very important. That came about because of the investigations in the, in the late 1990s. And really it's, it's a fuel day conversation more about what is the difference between uh, how resilient plants are and how we can respond to sudden uh, meat processing issues and how efficient plants are. Do we want plants to be really large? Um, this is some information. We will be sharing all the slides today um, that we're using and, and also recording this. So um, these are just some for your information. If you're interested in seeing where we get some of this data or, or how you can track plant size in your particular state, you can follow some of these reports. All right, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Gary and Gary is gonna give us a, a, a presentation on um, some of the current state that led us to allocate grant dollars, as well as um, some of the grant availability for producers. My name is Gary Sullivan. I'm an associate professor at the University of Nebraska, and my focus is really in meat processing. And today, in, in my part of the talk and webinars, really talking about grant opportunities for new and existing meat processing plants. Uh, with COVID, everything has changed, and, and it really has evolved how what's available and, and how business has been done in many in many of the small plants. And so today we're really going to talk about some of those opportunities that we have and, and things to consider as we move forward. Um, on Tuesday's presentation, there was some things that were covered. We may overlap just a little bit that talks about those concepts, but also want to dig deep because it's important to think about it as we move forward in this concept. And so to, in today's presentation, we're really going to focus on really three points that we're, we're going to cover. You know briefly review what the meat inspection is and what requirements are to sell products. Um, this is important to understand because depending upon the type of facility that people have and depending upon uh, what service they're providing, it may be that they're available to get grants or they may not. Uh, the second one is really just talking about the impact of COVID in meat processing operations. And, and these are uh, important to think about broad scale because really that was what part of what brought around the change of what we have and then finishing up really talking about the grant opportunities that are available through it. So when we think of it, what is it re that is required when we sell meat products and really in the end. With the way our regulations and our, our laws are written. The, the product must be inspected. And so there really are two main options for that. USDA Food Safety Inspection Service really provides that federal inspection. So each facility is registered, has a grant of inspection, and would have an inspector present um, at all the times during slaughter, as well as at least some point during the day when non-slaughter operations are going on. Another option for selling meats is with state meat inspection, and in Nebraska, we do not have a state meat inspection, so that's important to keep in mind for our Nebraska participants, but there are other, uh, several other states around the country that do have a state meat inspection. Now, with that, they are able to sell products within the state unless their state is one of the eight that um, is part of the um, 
cooperative interstate shipment program. And then they are allowed to uh, ship across state lines if their state participates and they enroll in the program. Um, the other part that we can come to is really that custom exempt side. And this is where people are really having animals harvested that they own. And, and this product is one that cannot be sold. And ultimately the custom exempt processor, what they're doing is they are providing a service to the owner of an animal. Uh, and when they do this, the animal, the animal's brought in, they harvest it, and they give the meat back to it. One of the things that fits in the regulations is it does say that these products are required to be labeled as not for sale. And, and, and so it clearly is stamped on each package that goes through it because it is not an inspected product. It is exempt from in, inspection, but it's really only able to be used by the owner, their non-paying guests and workers that they have in their home and, and, and their business. And so there are limitations on what it can be done with it. Now, there are there is the capability to have multiple owners. And this is where you can talk about buying a side of beef or a half a hog or a quarter of a beef. And in reality, what you're doing is you're purchasing that animal prior to harvest. And that's how it gets in there. And we can have multiple inner owners. And so if everyone is getting a quarter beef, there can be four owners of that animal. But if we, when we look at the regulations, it does say that that do, has to be identified prior to the time of harvest. And the custom exempt processor needs to have that written in the records of who owns the product. And so it is important to keep that in mind. Now, one thing that it complement can case this a little bit is the herd share program. And this was something that was just approved in the state of Nebraska this year. Uh, again, it's kind of copied a little bit after Wyoming's program, but in Nebraska with the, uh, the recent approval this spring, it's not fully defined what it is. One challenge with it is it really in some ways starts skirting around some of the regulations that USDA has on it. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that uh, interaction between USDA, FSIS, and with the custom exempt herd share program is kind of sorts out. Uh, I'm not sure how that will go, but it is important to keep in mind that it it's following the the word of the the rules and 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 maybe in some ways, but maybe not uh, the intent of the regulations on it. One thing to keep in mind with it also is. The USDA, when we talk about multiple owners, is it doesn't say how many owners can be of that animal. And that may be where the herd share has its, its, its legs to stand on in there. And so ultimately, though, it's important to keep in mind what it takes. And when we talk about rural development, we talk about retained ownership, and we want to be able to market products to people around us, we have to look at what it takes to do that. And so if you're really wanting to sell individual cuts, it does require the uh, FSIS inspection. If you want to market the animals as a portion of an animal or a whole animal at a time, that's when that custom exempt processing really can come into play. With that, there are a few different USDA definitions that I think are important to keep in mind as we move forward, because these definitions will help kind of clarify in some ways who's eligible or and, and to what uh, can be done in, in that. And so with that, USDA does define plant size. And so they actually have three plant sizes that they have. The first one they define as a very small plant. And this is one that has fewer than 10 employees or has less than $2.5 million in annual sales. And so that very small plant size is, is uh, defined by this. A small plant is from 11 to 499 employees. And one thing to think when we do this, oftentimes when we talk about it, we talk about small and very small plants and they will sometimes get grouped together in that classification. Now, anything 500 employees or above is considered a large plant. We don't actually have a mid-size classification of USDA. And so it, it really fits small, very small, or it's considered a large plant as far as the regulatory aspects go. The other part in rural development has a definition. And so when we look at some of their grants that are out there, they talk about development in rural areas. And so with that definition, it says any area that has less than 50,000 residents in it. And so in, in Nebraska's case, there's quite a bit of Nebraska that falls into that rural area when it comes to the rural um, development aspects with it. So with that, we're going to shift a little bit and just talk a little bit about COVID's impact on the meat industry. And, 
And as everyone knows, and I'm not, I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit here, is it really was a sizable impact. It was something we haven't experienced really before as it came on. But one thing to keep in mind is really that cost to employees. And this is the employees of the meat industry. We can talk about economic impacts and, and we'll talk about uh, at the impacts of the shutdown on down and upstream impacts of that. But we need to think about that impact on the employees. And, and some of the numbers, there, there haven't been as many updated recent numbers, but in those first six months of the pandemic, employees in the meat industry accounted for 42,000 cases and, and over 200 USDA inspectors were uh, diagnosed with COVID. With that, there was 203 meat industry employees that died in that first six months, as well as uh, four inspectors that died during that time. And this comes from across 494 different meat processing plants. And so we can talk about a lot of the impacts, but I think it's really important to start to talking about what that economic impact was. And with the plants, with the illnesses, with the changes that had to come out, really with the regulations and, and rec guidance documents that were there, production slowed down. We spaced people out. We had fewer employees present. There was a lot more people out in quarantine or, or afraid to come to work on it. But that had a major impact. And I would say the biggest impact that we had was really in that April to May time. And in that time period was really when we were starting to get some of the guidance from our regulatory agencies on what are the best practices for production. And so these are just some, um, some charts that I pulled about, again, that first six months of COVID, what happened to production. And if we look at in this, the, the blue line that we have, it's that blue line that we can see, and, and specifically when we look at cattle and pig slaughter, we had 40% or greater reduction in capacity during those few weeks uh, at the end of April and May. In poultry, we had an impact as well, but it wasn't quite as large as what we had in, in the red meat species. And part of what was caused there is the workers uh, and sh worker shortages coming in. But also we had 49 different plants that were closed at some point during COVID um, due to outbreaks in the plants. And that made a big impact when you have a large processor that closes, that can make a big impact on the total that are there. But ultimately over kind of that eight week period, we had about an 18% reduction on average and it created a backlog of about a million head of cattle and about two and a half million head of hogs. And so there is some work that was slowing down production, but we're still working on getting through some of that backlog. And one of the noticeable changes that really happened is there was a big impact on that small and very small and custom plants that happened there. You know, one of the things that happened is we had a disparity. There was a shortage of retail products. We had a shift from food service type products to retail products uh, and a reduction in production and output. At the same time, because of that reduction, uh, reduction in processing capacity, we had a surplus in that supply of live animals as it went along. And so these were important to think about that economic impact of what we had in each of those. And so what these small and very small plants did is they went from a lead time on harvesting and scheduling animals for harvest from maybe one month to three months out to some of them are working 18 to 24 months out to really schedule that harvest. And, and I talked to some of the processors in Nebraska, and they're still in that 18 month time frame that they're looking at scheduling it out. It, it's changed a little bit. The prices of animals aren't as uh, inexpensive as they are were early in COVID, but there still is that demand. And, and, and I hope it keeps up for the processors because it's really been beneficial in some ways but also very labor intensive for those processors. One of the things that happened as that is many of the small processors really had to look at maybe optimizing their process a little bit and their efficiency to really increase the throughput. How could they move more animals and, and make it through it? And, and these were some of the steps that they had to do that. One of the things that several states, I think there were 18 different states that actually used part of their CARES Act funds that were directed towards the state actually 
pushed some of that towards small processors really as a way to increase the process and harvesting capacity uh, in those plant estates. And so it was really focused towards those small processors and how they could make it work. And so uh, there were several states that had it. Um, for example, Missouri had a program where depending on if you were harvest or if you were further processing or, or other categories, there was different uh, amounts of money that could be applied for to uh, allow for increase in equipment or modifications of infrastructure that would allow more processing to happen. So this is really the framework of why what's out there. And, and with it, there really are some funding opportunities that are available through USDA. Uh, some of these are one-time funds, things that were brought out directly related to the uh, pandemic. Other ones are really more ongoing programs that help broader development and not maybe focus solely on the, uh, uh, the specifically on the meat industry itself. And so with the USDA, the funding organizations or subgroups of USDA that have it have different objectives. And so Build Back Better is one of the Biden administration's uh, programs that really looks broadly about how to, to bring back the country to some of the pre-COVID type aspects. But in USDA, uh, the Ag Marketing Service does administer this. But ultimately, one of the key things is talking about expanded meat and poultry processing capacity. And I have that kind of bolded here because that was the key part that's in it. But more broadly, it's talking about how can they increase competition and level playing, playing field and really build a better system. But one of the key things is really looking at that capacity and, and uh, being able to allow for uh, serving the, the, the needs of the, how the small processor can serve some of those needs. The other thing is with USDA rural development. And so um, the Ag Marketing Service does the Build Back Better administration and, and of the funds, but the USDA Rural Development is really setting, is set there to have a way to improve the economy and life in rural America. How can they make investments? How can they provide funds to help maintain the, the advantages that many people like about living in the rural parts of the United States? And so when they talk about this, there's really four areas broadly that they talk about trying to address with the rural development funds, workforce development training, uh, things related to infrastructure and equipment financing, being able to allow those businesses to, to take place, but also making connections across it to, to really allow that development to take place. And again, part related to the workforce development is providing training and education and workforce and uh, and apprenticeship opportunities for those areas. So they're really looking at how can they facilitate uh, a small plant to have success uh, in these rural areas or small businesses to have success in the rural developed areas. And that's really related to economic development and rural vitality as we go through it. So with the USDA, again, the, the Build Back Better initiative really has multiple portions, but USDA's portion in June 8th, it was announced that there was $4 billion being uh, uh, contributed towards that. And so really broadly relating to production and processing and distribution of foods, but also looking at markets and consumers as well. And that's in addition to the $1 billion that was previously announced that really was going to address food insecurity. And so that's $5 billion that went towards that, um, those causes. And when we look at meat processing, uh, of that $4 million, it was a half a billion that was addressed towards the small processing. And some of it was specifically uh, targeted towards that small and very small plant. And so the meat and poultry inspection readiness grant, these were due on August 2nd, and there was $55.2 million that were earmarked towards this program. And what it was is plants would be able to apply to either have uh, have support to help provide increasing capacity or new facilities or building as a way to uh, either increase their throughput or to enable them to uh, go from a custom plant to an inspected plant uh, and really provide more capacity in that small size. The other part that was directed towards the small and very small plants was the overtime and holiday inspection fee reduction. And this actually had $100 million 
uh, that was directed towards it. Now, one thing interesting about it with the, these is they actually go through and calculate what the exact costs are. And so each year it will change based on what the prior year is, but the total cost of an overtime inspection per hour is about $80 uh, per hour. Now, what they wanted to do was provide a, a reduced cost for the small plants to be able to do that. And so a small plant would have a 30% reduction in cost and a 75% reduction in cost of that overtime or holiday inspection for very small plants. Because part of it is if you have fewer employees and you have fewer animals that you're having to spread that cost over, it can really be cost prohibitive. And so this allows uh, the reduction in cost to go from uh, beginning on October 11th. And plants that want to participate in this have until March of 2022 to apply for it. And if they do have any costs that are incurred in overtime or holiday inspection fees uh, prior to that time, but after October 11th, they can get a refund or a rebate based on what they paid. And so this is something that you do have to apply to be part of, but it does provide the advantage with it. I do want to take a, just a step back. When we talked about the readiness grants, uh, I'd read somewhere that there was approximately $100 million in proposals that were received in that first round of funding related to that. So the other part and the remaining part of that $500 million was really geared towards uh, figuring out how to have investments and opportunities and, and infrastructure to do that. And so um, there was a request for information um, that was due on October 30th that really figured out how can we best do it. And, and there was broad questions that were asked that the feedback needed to come into it and talk to talk about different things like training and workforce development and market uh, shares and infrastructure needs. And essentially the request for information that was due in August was really set up to figure out how the federal government and how USDA can best invest the $344 million that are left of that um, into the, to the, uh, uh, the industry to make the biggest impact. And so they're anticipating at the end of the year is we'll have a release of the framework and that's when we'll have calls for proposals then um, to get for those grants. The other thing that was announced just a couple of weeks ago or a week and a half ago was there was going to be another hundred million dollars in loan guarantees that the federal government was doing. So one of the things is today um, on the, the 14th of October, we have lender training webinars that are going on on the loan guarantees. And when those come out, I think there'll be a little bit more information that can be provided um, and clarification of what that program is. The other thing that USDA AMS is overseeing is the pandemic response and safety grants. And this is $650 million and it's really across many different ag industries, but it does include food processors in it. And what this does is it's set up to provide grants to reimburse for actual cost incurred to COVID. And so from the beginning of the pandemic through the end of 2021 is what they're looking at doing, but it's, from $1,500 to $20,000 um, in, in funds that can be it. But these are things that were actual spent on infrastructure changes, uh, safety equipment, uh, renovations, things that were done to help improve the safety. It also can include uh, housing costs or any non-reimbursed uh, costs related to vaccines or things set up to monitor employees' health as they entered the plants. And so those are all areas that can come into this and these are due um, on November 22nd uh, that this proposal has been pushed back a couple times but it was finally released a, a week ago and and there is a six week period for it to come into. Now we're going into some of the R&D grants or the rural development grants and these are ones that tend to be more ongoing programs. There's a couple that are special programs related to COVID but for the most part these are ones that are really some continuing programs that are set up and, and opportunities to, to go with it. Some are grants made directly to producers and processors, others are made through lenders and then they work with it and so there are different varieties of what we have and so um, in this one, the value-added producer grants, uh, they they really have uh, grants that are up to $250,000 in su 
and size, the producers must cover at least half the cost of the project. Um, the last proposal on it was came out in the spring of 2021 for the funding of fiscal year 22 that we're in now, and they anticipate next spring to have the funding call for the following grant that comes with it. The next one is micro, micro entrepreneur. Uh, assistance program, and these are for businesses and, uh, that have less than 10 employees in rural areas. And one of the things with this is there has to be a micro enterprise development organization that actually receives the fund. And then from that can provide loans and technical assistance to it, and these can be related uh, to working capital or financing uh, and purchase of equipment and then improving the real estate and so they're really working with some of those very small businesses to really help them get up and going and, and, and working towards that. But this is an example of one that it really has an intermediate organization that first of all applies for the, the funds themselves. The next one also is a, uh, a loan and a grant program. And this is where rural utility services can borrow funds and then really loan that money to local businesses to recreate, create and retain employment really again that economic development and rural vitality comes to it uh, a 20 percent match of the funding is required by the recipient or from the utility service to have it happen and there's decisions made on this quarterly and so rural utilities that want to do this there is a quarterly um, proposal that that come out with it another one similar to that is the intermediate uh, excuse me, intermediary relending program that provides low in interest loans to the rural lenders. And again, their their idea then is to loan that to the rural businesses. Uh, in this, again, up to $250,000 in the size of a loan and can cover up to 75% of the project. There is some for grants that can be a, a smaller amount excuse me, that, uh, that was on a different one, but this is just a loan here that covers uh, parts of up to the project. The other one is uh, a business and industry loan program guarantee. And this is where lenders apply to provide loans for businesses. Uh, one of the things with it is it comes with a federal guarantee. And the other part with it is it's, as it is a, a loan, there is collateral that needs to be consistent with a common loan to value, value policy. And so these want to be really high quality loans that they're making, but there is support from the federal government on that guarantee side. The last one that we have here is really related to renewable energy and efficiency. And so this is an area that may be of benefit to small processors because we have cooling costs, we have potential of having rendering costs or other things with that, and figuring out how to have uh, uh, improvement in the project. And so if we look at it, there's funding for renewable energy systems or improvements to existing uh, 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 existing systems. And in these, we have loan guarantees that can be up to 75% of the cost of the project, or if it's a grant, it can be up to a quarter of the cost of the project, but is not uh, does not need to be replayed. And so the, the totals on these are, are half million dollars for the system and $250,000 really for that efficiency improvement uh, in the existing system. So these are an examples of some of the federal programs that are out there. There also, also are some state programs at times that can help with uh, research and development and other costs associated to that through the Department of Economic Developments and others. So depending on the state that you're in, it's important to look and see what some of those opportunities are, but there are funds out there, some on a one-time basis and others on a continual basis that really could be there to set up and, and help start the financing of a program. Well, thank you, Gary. We appreciate you sharing some of those comments with us. And now we're gonna have uh, Greg Eibach, who's gonna actually talk a little bit about what UNL um, has been doing to, to try to help develop some of the infrastructure and some of the training that Gary was, was talking about. And, and just as a reminder, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, and we will get to all those questions. Well, thank you very much, Elliot, and for this opportunity to join the webinar here. But, you know, as we uh, look around, uh, we still have, uh, uh, a backlog of animals trying to get through the system, and we have, still have employee shortages across the nation, and especially here in Nebraska. 
uh, plant operators, whether they be a small, very small custom exempt or some of our larger packing plants have trouble finding employees. So they're then faced with the uh, question of whether to uh, uh, expect overtime, which employees over uh, that experience too much overtime burn out and seek other employment, or they are uh, uh, asked to put on additional shifts. And if we don't have enough employees to run the first shift, we definitely don't have enough employees to run additional shifts. So those continue to contribute to the backlog that uh, we're experiencing. This has led to uh, discussions about, um, you know, that we hear commonly about we need more plants, we need more capacity to be able to process the animals. And again, employees become part of that equation is are there enough employees out there to be able to address this need and uh, if we do expand capacity. So as USDA announced some of the actions that um, Gary did an outstanding job of outlining. UNL responded to the request for information and we work to uh, structure our, uh, our information that we provided based on our interaction with the industry, uh, the producing industry, the processing industry, and uh, also looking at uh, how regulations affect um, both those industries and how, how those plants can respond to them, especially small and very small. I think many times when we think about small and very small plants, we uh, in many areas, especially rural Nebraskans and beef producers, lump the custom exempt plants in with those federally inspected plants. And there really is a big differentiation there as, uh, and you know, I see one of the questions is what keeps a custom exempt from being coming federally inspected? And with federal inspection comes not only the ability to sell individual cuts, but it comes with the ability to enter the export marketplace as well. And so FSIS has really guarded that regulatory process and kept the bar high to be able to preserve not only food safety uh, considerations, but preserve our export marketplace as they uh, move forward. And so the hurdles that are out there are mainly structural. And many of our custom exempt plants are not, uh, do not have the physical plant expectations or uh, they don't have the ability to make that jump physically from a custom exempt to a federally inspected. And so that's probably one of our major hurdles out there. But we also need to remember that we also have uh, biosecurity concerns. We have worker health uh, and safety considerations that have come about because of COVID. Uh, and then just the ability to understand and comply with federal regulations that also become hurdles uh, as we jump from one to the, uh, one level of custom exempt to federally inspected. And so I think there's opportunities for us and in our, in our response to the request for information, UNL identified not only ways to help facilitate that jump from custom exempt to federally inspected, but also ways to augment that custom exempt experience here in Nebraska and uh, make that better for our custom exempt operators to be able to uh, adapt, provide a great product to the customers that want to be have their animals, whether they're in a herd share program or they are their owned animals uh, specifically, uh, to be able to help them expand their operations. Uh, we are excited to uh, uh, have USDA uh, absorb those different comments. The comments that UNL offered were very similar to what we saw offered by states, departments of agriculture, other universities. And so I think you, uh, the USDA will have some very clear guidance. And so we're actually excited to see what the request for proposals might look like as a result of that. And we will work to, uh, again, with the industry at that time to try to 
put forward a proposal that will not only help Nebraska's producers, but help Nebraska's small and very small processors, whether they be federally inspected or custom exempt, adapt and uh, enhance their experience at uh, serving uh, our public, uh, Nebraska citizens especially. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I'm just gonna go down to the comments and then uh, state the question and then pass it to the individual. I think Bess would be able to respond to that. Um, so Greg, looks like you kind of, you answered Jared's question. What's the main reason holding back custom exempt plants from becoming federally expected? I, I'd also add uh, um, HACCP regulations as well, which um, we know is one of the primary reasons why we saw a lot of the smaller plants actually fall out is because they weren't actually able to to meet those um, additional food safety reg regulations. Um, Catherine asks, how do you think we'll deal with labor short shortages of labor? Are we going to continue to rely on immigrants or will the job change to attract more young people? Catherine, I think that's a good question. I'll answer it a little bit and then I'll pass it off to Gary. Uh, maybe he can talk a little bit about some of that workforce development. Um, I think finding labor to work in packing plants has always been a difficult issue and has traditionally relied upon uh, immigrant labor uh, or first generation um, immigrants. When we talk but one of those things that we know is that as wages increase, it tends to attract more people. Uh, we've seen uh, entry level positions that meet packing plants go as high as $25 with the signing bonus per hour. That's, that's pretty high. And so I think we are going to still rely upon immigrant labor to a certain extent. But if we're thinking about developing that workforce, um, I think you and your University of Nebraska can play a key role in helping train smaller or uh, very small plants. And Gary, would you mind just maybe talking a little bit about that workforce development? Yeah, another aspect that I think you need to keep in mind with it is a lot of people don't think of meat science as an option. And, and that's one of the things being a meat scientist at UNL is really exposing to what opportunities are out there. You know, I was talking to a small processor the other day and what they're paying their meat cutters is a nice living, especially in, in small towns. And so there's a lot of opportunities. And I think sometimes it's just getting uh, young people exposed to what, what's out there and what can become part of it. Um, so we've talked a lot about training and, and uh, the meat science program has historically done uh, training in it. And we're really looking at figuring out how to expand that. Uh, we do did add a youth extension specialist who's uh, focused on youth meat science products. And so it's really a nice addition with that. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Greg. Well, I think the other thing that UNL can play a great role in and that we already are doing at the uh, at different levels, Gary's involved with it, as well as or we're partnering with um, Innovate Nebraska and some other groups, is looking at how we bring you know, uh, innovation robotics uh, into the uh, into play here and develop those that might be able to use to replace some of the employees that we're unable to find. If we can figure out how to use a robot to disassemble a carcass, uh, we won't need uh, have the same amount of employees needed at our very large plants. And if we can find ways to e incorporate some uh, robotics or uh, uh, innovative processing tools in our small and very small plants that could also be a big help. Thank you, Greg. And I think you partially answered Jared's question was talking about how to how do we address some of that efficiency and throughput. And it sounds like from your, your comment that that uh, call for proposal or call for comments that UNL submitted was also part to, to try to address some of that uh, innovation and technology there as well. So uh, Gary, Jay, Jay asked two questions, said, what is for the value added grants, what is the time period allowed for the projects? So he's thinking the length of those grants, is it one year or two years? Or, and for the loan programs, what is the interest rate and if it's fixed or variable? Uh, so on the uh, on the grants, I think uh, it, it depends on the program. Some I, I 
some of them I think are, they all tend to be low or very low interest on it for the most part. Uh, it does depend on it and each one has a little bit of a difference in setup. Um, as far as the length, I'd have to go look again on the value added grants of, of how long that is um, to, to get that exact amount. Thank you, Gary. And as a reminder, we will be uh, publishing a two-page uh, summary of this of the webinar with additional with these questions being answered. So if we don't answer it here in the in the live portion, we will get it to it in the in the two-page uh, summary. Uh, Audra asked, "Where can I find links to the various grant opportunities for rural communities? Is there a contact person or group that can be contact for various questions regarding the grant?" opportunities. Uh, Greg, maybe you can talk about the Rural Development Center. And Gary, do you have any, uh, I guess we can include some of those links in, in the two-page write-up as well. Yes, I, and Gary's probably uh, more uh, uh, a better person to answer this question, but USDA Rural Development has offices not only here in Lincoln, but across the Nebraska and many of them are uh, located in conjunction with uh, a uh, FSA office or an NRCS office. And so that would maybe be a first place to answer uh, to question to see where the closest uh, rural development uh, staff might be. But a lot of these uh, grants are coming out of the rural development, especially to, uh, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure facilities and some of those loan programs. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Gary, looks like this one's for you. I uh, says, has there been any grants? This is from Jesse. Has there been any grants throughout the pandemic for current very small inspected establishments? I've seen a ton out there facilities to move towards USDA, but not sure about grants offered to already inspected facilities. Yeah, so some of the programs that look at the facilities that are going towards inspection, they do have uh, a, a, an additional amount that can be used for increasing capacity. And so it'll depend on the amount. I think that the, uh, the loan program that will be coming out, I anticipate that that will follow a little bit of the readiness grants that was part of the Build Back Better, uh, that $100 million that was addressed. And it, it's not defined, but I, I'm a, I would assume that that would have some... Uh, uh, that would allow people to get loans for the existing facilities. Thank you. And it looks like Jesse also provided some comments uh, to that saying he'd love to expand and have labor covered, but would need the grant funds to cover to pull it off. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, another person said exactly what agency do I contact to apply for the grant for a new small plant grant? Uh, Gary, do you care to address that? Um, so the most of the the Build Back Better ones are uh, administered through AMS, so the USDA Ag Marketing Service. Uh, the other ones are through rural development. And so when we do that, I would say the aspect with the uh, the uh, uh, look at that the rural develop or excuse me the AMS ones and, and actually I think some of the rural development ones are also available or uh, end up having the application that's submitted online through the USDA's portal mm -hmm. yeah thanks Gary and then Jared has uh, two last comments he said I, I believe I was told by USDA inspector the main structural obstacle from becoming custom exempt to federally inspected plant is just adding an office separate from the kill floor uh, is that correct? And then his second comment was um, he has looking to build a small plant with a small population of 700 was wastewater disposal. Our town's sewer plant can handle about three hogs a day, according to our town's head maintenance person. What are the options to solve this problem if a person wants to build and handle more animals a day? So looks like two questions there uh, about if it's right to build a just a separate office? And if so, how many, how do we solve wastewater problems? Gary, maybe you can talk a little bit about plant development. Um, yeah, so one part of the inspected facility that you do have to have is there is a, you do have to have an inspector's office with a bathroom attached to it. And that's just part of, uh, there is a list of 
requirements that USDA has of minimum things that are required for the inspection. And so that there, if I recall, there's like seven or eight bullet points that everyone has to be uh, uh, fulfilled for it to happen. Uh, and in addition to that, we, uh, um, you know, it's the sanitary design and some of those that are just kind of the minimum things that are required in addition to the HACCP plans and the rest of it. Thank you. So Jared, I'm, I'm not sure what you do to, um, for the wastewater disposal, Greg. I could maybe take a stab at that yeah. a little bit. The uh, USDA rural development would also have monies for uh, uh, wastewater disposal and upgrading those systems for small communities that they could look like at. Some of those are grant programs for uh, certain uh, size of towns and cities, and some of them are, are lower interest loans. And so I think that would also be an opportunity to, to look at those. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the Nebraska Business Development uh, Group that's uh, located in, uh, I'm answering Shelby's question now, Elliot, uh, but um, they, um, uh, they, they're located at UNO, but they provide some assistance in that. But I also think that uh, uh, Dr. Sullivan and his group at the Meat Science Department at UNL would be a good place to start with some basic questions to help point you in the right direction and help give you some advice. Their extension function is an important part of uh, the service they provide to uh, Nebraska's uh, animal industry. And so, uh, you know, I think that uh, that would also be a good place to start. And that's something that we're putting into, uh, we think will be important in a proposal that we might submit is how do we ask for funding or support to be able to provide services to producers, to small packing plants, uh, to communities to be able to help them understand how they might be able to expand meat processing in Nebraska. Yeah, Shelby, and I would also add to that, that the Tuesday webinar that's available at cap.unl.edu, uh, Charlie McPherson, who is, is kind of the lead person at Nebraska Small Business Development Center, he, he's actually helped uh, several uh, meat processing plants uh, develop uh, marketing plans, strategies, financial cash flows, and, uh, and he could, he'd be able to help you with there. Looks like we're about uh, seven minutes over. If we're gonna at, answer one last question, Oren, because he had posted earlier in the chat. Um, if an existing rancher cow-calf producer is looking to open a facility that is federally inspected and processed approximately 40 head per month to start, is located in a predominantly rural location within 60 miles, largest town is 650 people. What kind of grant opportunities are we looking at? And it looks like it's more dollar amounts, 200 or 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 or more. Gary, maybe you can address some of that. Gary, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, it, a lot of the loan are up to $250,000 from what I can see on the programs. Um, and I, I'll have to look a little bit more into some of the specifics on the rural development side. And we'll have to see what the, uh, the additional Build Back Better funds, what those loan programs come out as that were uh, just announced last week. So when I think about grants, I think about that's money that may not necessarily need paid back, which is different than a loan. And I think that is uh, one of the probably uh, uh, dimensions that is lacking here is that, uh, you know, in order to uh, have a very small plant, the investment needed is pretty high. Uh, and to be able to generate enough business to make the loan payments is probably a hurdle that Oren is, is thinking about. And so I'm not sure that uh, what grant opportunities themselves are looking at. Gary, do you know that answer to that question? 
Yeah. Um, I, I, from, from what's out there, they had the initial amount in the Build Back Better that is grant focused. Um, when we get into the, uh, a lot of the other ones, they are loan focused. And so it depends, I think, where the, the rest of that Build Back Better funds, where they go with that. But right now, a lot of it is loan based uh, and not grant based. Well, we're going to have to just cut it off there uh, about 10 minutes over, but we appreciate everyone joining with us. If you look in the chat, uh, Ryan Evans uh, posted a, a link to a brief survey. We encourage you to, to fill that out, just to give us some feedback on um, what we think we can do better and what we can uh, do in future upcoming webinars. Uh, We'll hope you'll join us next Thursday at noon central for an update on farm programs, foreign income and agriculture outlook with Brad Lubin here at UNL and also Pat Westhoff, director of the Food and Agriculture Policy Research Institute at the University of Missouri. Thanks again for joining us and hope to see you next Thursday.